Good afternoon and welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. Today we'll examine 100 years of black movies from Gone with the Wind to black exploitation films to Black Panther using the struggles and triumphs of these artists and films as a prism to explore black culture, civil rights, and racism in America. Please welcome today's speakers, Will Haygood, author and journalist and superstar, Dave Filippi, <laughs> Dave Filippi, Director of Film and Video for the Wexner Center of the Arts, and our host, Ray Poprocki, Publisher of, and General Manager of the Dispatch Magazines. Ray, we look forward to today's conversation. Hello, everyone. Great to be here. Let me get set up here for a moment. All right, Will, Dave, good to see you. So Will, uh, Will Haygood and Columbus Monthly have had a, uh, a relationship for quite a while, mostly him or us writing about him, his accomplishments, or printing an excerpt from one of his books, uh, Tigerland, for instance. And during that time, I got to know uh, Will a little bit. Um, but it all started, uh, of course, where things start in this city in some cases, in the office of Larry James. <laughs> Larry invited uh, myself and Pat Lozinski, I don't know if Pat's here today from the library, and Will to have uh, a lunch discussion. I think the butler was just starting to form as a movie. And so that was real exciting to to get to know Will in that way. That relationship escalated about a year ago when Dave Ghosh, the editor of Columbus Monthly, approached me with a, a big, bold idea. And Dave is here today. I'd like to acknowledge Dave right here at the dispatch table. He said, let's do something that would devote the entire issue of the magazine to one topic. It's something we'd never done before in the history of the magazine, which dates to 1975. And that topic became to be called the raw reality of living while black in Columbus. And the other big, bold idea that Dave suggested, and again, that had never been done before in the history of the magazine, was that we needed a guest editor, someone that had the perspective and nuance of Columbus to be able to help us pull this off. We immediately had one name in mind, and only one name, and that was Will Haygood. Will, fortunately, despite working on this book, said yes. I think he said no at first, but then he said yes. <laughs> Before I could get my plan in place to convince you otherwise, he came back and said, we're gonna do this. So this is what the result was, was our May issue of Columbus Monthly that I had some of the most memorable experiences in my career in the conversations among Dave and Will and myself, discussing what was going to be in here where three hours felt like 15 minutes. Um, and what came through to me was Will's curiosity his passion, his compassion, his generosity, his knowledge, his insight, his sense of place, his sense of fairness, and his sense of purpose. And they all came through so, so strong. And reading this book, all of those things came through in Will's trademark way of deeply researched, compelling stories. So personally, this is a very cool thing for me to be a part of. So thank you for letting me be participating, and let's, let's get to it. So, Will, can you describe the journey that led you to writing this book? How you got to the point of saying, this is what I want to do? Yeah. Um, first of all, you know, thank uh, Ray and... Dave uh, for really wanting to do the, uh, in the special issue of this magazine, friends of mine of all over the country and were calling me after it came out and they read it. They were so uh, 
so pleasantly surprised by all of the talent that we were able to bring together between the pages of this magazine. And so uh, Ray and Dave, you really done something special and I was happy to be a part of it. So thank you for that. Uh, you know, not to, uh, not to name drop, but I was hanging out with Oprah. <laughs> it was in uh, Sandra Bullock's house. Uh, with Lee Daniels and Forrest Whitaker. <laughs> and there was a soiree on the set of The Butler. And I'm, and I was in the kitchen and just looking at the people walking around Sandra Bullock's home. You know, these, all this talent had gathered to make this movie about this White House butler. And there were like <clears throat> seven Oscar winners in the room. And I'm looking, and I'm really just, I really just uttered this to myself. And I just said to myself, wow, all of this talent, white and black and young and not so old, Lenny Kravitz and Mariah Carey, Forrest Whitaker, uh, Link from the Mod Squad, uh, Clarence Williams III, who we just recently lost, you know, and Oprah and Lee Daniels. And I just said, somebody, somebody should write a book about this moment in cinematic history. And Terrence Howard, he was also in the movie, he was standing near me and he walked around to me and he put his finger in my chest and he said, you're the writer, so you ought to write it. <laughs> and so that night I just really started thinking about, you know, why is it so hard to get a movie with black stars made, even if you have Oprah Winfrey? I mean, studios turned her down. They just didn't want to do the movie, uh, you know. First of all, it was a story about a black man told from the black man's perspective. Usually a story like that would have been told from the perspective of the eight white presidents that he worked for. But Lee Daniels and the script writer, Mr. Danny Strong, they really said, no, 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 we're gonna honor Will's story. Will's story is about this man who Will found, you know, and we're going to keep the spotlight uh, on him, you know. And so knowing how hard people had to work to raise the money to make that movie made me think of a genuine pioneer in black film history, Mr. Oscar Michaud, who takes up a lot of this book. But he had to raise money, had to go around the country, begging, hat in hand, to get money. Hollywood paid no attention to him, you know, and he made his movies. But it was a hard trek and, you know, still a hard trek. And so I knew if I could write the story about how movies get made in all of these uh, various people who have a lot of passion to make movies. I knew if I could write the on-screen story and the off-screen story that it would mean something. So when did you actually st start that process? Uh, I was working on Tigerland, which came out in 2018, but before, you know, it takes like a year for a book to be edited and all that. So actually I was finished with Tiger Land, like at the end of 2016, going into 2017. So, and my editor asked me what I wanted to do, uh, to do next, and I gave him an idea, and he asked me to come to New York and meet with him, and so we're in New York. And my first thinking was a book about 50 years of film history, and he's sitting there at the restaurant, and he hears that pitch, and then he looks up, from the menu and said, no, 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 no. 
how about 100 years? You know, and I just very silently said to myself, dang on, the dude then just doubled my work. <laughs> You know, yeah, 50 years was perfect. You know, he didn't stress it all out going back to 1915. Yeah, you know, sort of took the air out of my balloon because I knew it was going to be a whole lot more work. But he was right. You know, he was absolutely right to start the, start the book. Uh, in 1915 with the movie <clears throat> The Birth of a Nation, you know, because there was a whole lot of KKK uh, stuff in the movie where they were the heroes, all the blacks were the villains, and that movie played in theaters around the country for four years, The Birth of a Nation, and it was just an ad for racism. That's all it was. It was just a three-hour ad for racism. It was taught in schools. The book that the movie was based on was taught in schools, you know, and that lasted for four years. And that really was the first movie where blacks rose up in mass to picket at the theaters. And, you know, that was, you know, that was where I started the book. And then I'm in my home in Washington, D.C., and I'm working on the book, and then Charlottesville happened. Heather Heyer, murdered in Charlottesville, uh, Nazi march, and then there were <laughs> Ku Klux Klan flags, and that literally was like, uh, you know, heartbroken. You know, here we are, you know, here's this book that I'm working on about, about rabbit racists insane people from 1915, and now, you know, here are more of those people of that ilk, you know, marching through Charlottesville, you know, like a hundred and two years later, you know. And in a way, I just knew right then, all right, this book is going to work. This book is going to work because these are things in this country that are still simmering. Martin Luther King Jr. said it though, people. He said, if America is destroyed, it will be destroyed from within, not from without, from within, not a foreign enemy. Martin Luther King Jr. said, America has the capability, the evil capability to destroy itself. I hope we stop that, I really do. I love the country. You know, I, you know, we all do, you know, but there are bad actors in this country and they must be stopped. They really must be stopped. So, um, I'm sorry, Dave, I'm gonna get to you, but I really wanna pick, on this, pick up on this line here. Um, so uh, you mentioned the birth of the nation and one of the points of your book is how it set sort of the, the narrative, right, for the rest of the country about how to view blacks. Right and that cinema had such a powerful influence on that. Right. And then you reference Charlottesville and this thread, right? Yep. So one of the things I was interested in was as you're writing the book, events like this, like George Floyd, the Confederate you know, uh, statues coming down, all of these things happening while you're writing the book, did that influence you in how, or make you change course in any way from, from your original perspective of, of the black experience in film? You know, the thing that I knew I had and to pay attention to was the sheer bravery of young people who would take out their cell phones in front of a police officer who was abusing somebody. That's film too, that's video. You know, and they would stand there, you know, the stress of that moment to take a picture, to capture abuse, you know, many filmmakers did it, but not in real time, of course, you know, and so, yes, yes, that had a, uh, you know, I mean, that had a big effect 
on, you know, this book. I think more than anything, it really proved to me that this book needed to be written. But speaking of that, Dave, so um, if you could give us some context, um, sort of where Will's book and the historical record of trying to document, you know, the black experience in film, where, can you give us some context on what came before and where Will's book may fit in? Sure. Um, <clears throat> You know, I, I, I really spent a lot of time with, it took me a long time to finish Will's book because I was constantly stopping and, and I was reading a galley so I didn't have all of the, the index to know where things were on pages and things like that, but I really spent a lot of time. Now let us stop right there to explain <laughs> what, what that galley is. Oh, a, a pre-edited. It's a pre-edited yeah. version of the book, you know. When I wrote my showdown, book about Thurgood Marshall, I gave my galley to Larry James and Mayor Coleman because the book was dedicated to them. And Mayor Coleman said, what's a galley? <laughs> you know, you know, something on a ship? <laughs> you know, so, so no, 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 you know, it was the sneak peek of the book before it's actually finally edited, yeah. so. And just spending a lot of time with it, you know, lots of different references that, that Will makes throughout the book, looking them up, spending more time, um, really getting a sense of it. And, you know, to put it in some context, you know, Will brings up Birth of a Nation and, um, you know, I went to, I was in college in the 80s and, you know, studying film, you know, kind of my whole my my whole life since then, and if you think about a film like Birth of a Nation, which um, it does have its place in film history, um, technical innovation, and undeniably influential filmmaker in D. W. Griffith, um, but you know, the, the if a if a film text, if a film history book talked about the, you know absolutely kind of unbelievable racism that's in the film. It was maybe a couple lines, um, maybe a couple lines of um, kind of rationalizing it. Well, it was 1915 and, you know, people, you know, didn't know better or whatever the excuse was. You know, as Will just mentioned, people knew at the time it was a deeply problematic film. You know, people were protesting it. Um, you know, there were, the, the thought that it came out to this um, kind of unsuspecting American public, um, and people didn't know that it was very, very racist and problematic. It's just absolutely not true, but also it was never really, it wasn't widely written about like that. And if you take, you know, that film and just kind of, you know, keep marching through film history, um, I mean, Will's book ultimately serves as this alternate film history to what we, you know, if you if you study film, what you and, and I should say also like things are there are much there are much more di diverse array of, of voices and scholars and books out now than there were you know 40 50 years ago, um, but it it is this amazing kind of alternative history to what was going on um, in Hollywood over the course of all of these years and how will kind of connects these dots, you know, from Birth of a Nation to Oscar Micheaux, to Hattie McDaniel, to uh, Dorothy Dandridge, um, to, you know, going from Oscar Micheaux, a complete maverick working outside of the system, to Melvin Van Peebles in the, in the 60s and 70s working outside of the system. I mean, that, he, he demonstrates that was one way for people to do it. It's, there's a system stacked against you. One way to, to get work done is to, um, to do it yourself. And, there's so many themes like that that, um, that come out of Will's book that, um, yeah, it, it's, it's just really an invaluable um, alternative take on, on Hollywood history. Um, and I, I, this can be for, for both, but I mean, on, asked about the influence events we're having on you as a writing book, but uh, the reverse of that. The timing of the book is important in the racial reckoning that we're having. Um, what do you think the, the alternative history, so to speak, that you would want this book to have? You know, what, um, what has been very, um, I guess, heartening 
for me in the you know very brief life of this book you know it's only officially been out for uh, one day it, the official publication day was yesterday uh, but um, I had in advance sent a copy to an actor uh, uh, whose name I won't mention, but he told me that he thinks that this book is going to embolden and empower every black actor, actress, director, and cinematographer in Hollywood. And I hope it does. I mean, there are black heroes in Hollywood and there are white heroes, people who tried to help Sidney Poitier early in his career, tried to help James Edwards. Me and like Stanley Kramer, who was white, Ralph Nelson, who's white, you know, good, big hearted people. There just were not enough of them. And, you know, it just was not enough of them. I mean, heck. Face it, only this year, media-wise, just this year, we have started seeing many commercials with mixed-race couples, with black-white couples. I mean, we see it now every day, you know, with the Cheerio commercial or the Tide commercial, you know, hey, mom, hey, dad, you know, and the mom and dad who walks into the room is, One's black and one's white, you know, or two men or two women. And so there was this thing in Hollywood called the Hayes Code. And the Hayes Code, you know, started in the 30s and it was ostensibly to keep nudity and frank sex talk from movies. But really, it was to keep black blacks from film, you know, black loyalty on film or black love stories. Uh, you know, in films, and so, you know, I, I, I hope, you know, I hope that people in Hollywood read the book, you know, and, you know, and learn from it, you know, it seems that it's a nice, nice time for this story to have been told. And Dave, I mean, from, at the well, Wexner Center, what? Oh, go ahead. No, I, you know, please pick up. Well, I guess one thing, one point I was going to bring up, even me saying, you know, film history, um, you know, something as white readers, white audiences, we have to come, you know, when we think of film history, we don't say white film history. We just say film history. We say film history and then like black film history. And right there, that's, that's problematic. And, you know, when we're talking about film history and really meaning white film history, you know, kind of asking those questions, who was in power, who was in making these decisions, why they were making these decisions. And, and Will gets into, the, into, the, in, um, gets into it into the book in a number of places. Like when a, or, and we had a guest at the Wexner Center in the last couple of days, Michael Schultz, a very prolific Hollywood filmmaker. And you know, he would be in a studio meeting with obviously white executives and, and he would be talking about a film and they say, they wouldn't, they, what are we gonna do with a black film? Who's gonna wanna see this? You know, um, um, you know just the, the thinking that is, runs throughout um, Will's book that leads to, again, who gets cast in films, what roles they get, what films get greenlit, what films get made. Um, you know, it, this isn't the 1930s, this is like the 19, Tens, you know, and 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 right now that 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 um, artists are still um, dealing with this, and it, it it's certainly you know better now than it was in 1950, but it's a it's a condition and a problem that that still exists. You know, and it matters. It really matters who we have in the White House. It matters. I mean, it matters. Under President Obama, we had the movies that came out of Hollywood when he was in the White House. Fruitvale Station, 12 Years a Slave, Mandela, Lone Walk to Freedom, The Butler. There was an article that, that, you know, during that time period, all those movies came out in like 2013. A black man was in the White House. 
And the headline of the article was, Hollywood finally gets emancipated. That's in 2013. You know, it, it's like, uh, you know. Then there was another article that came out just last year. It said, and, uh, and the people who run Hollywood have left something like, uh, I don't know, they would know about this story. It said like something like $30 billion on the floor that black audiences would go see if those movies were out. I mean, Hollywood supposedly cares about green. They always say, we don't care about black or white, we just care about green money. Uh, you know, this study that came out, you know, it really paints a different picture from your business perspective that Hollywood, because it has run from diversity, has left billions on the table, billions, which is uh, awful. The one thing that's so exciting about um with Netflix, there, there, there's certainly some bad things too, but with um, Netflix and Amazon and Hulu, there is this hunger for more and more content, and it is giving people of um, artists and creators of color many more opportunities than if they had to just go through the traditional um, Hollywood system and, and kind of work one film at a time. You know, Holly, it, it's really an exciting time for um, you know people to have all kinds of opportunities and getting shows made for these different platforms, it's opening up more opportunities than, than have ever been there before. Yeah, it, it really is. I wrote a book about the great entertainer Sammy Davis Jr. The book came out some years ago, 2003, and I got a call, not to name drop, but from Denzel Washington, <laughs> who bought the rights to the Sammy book. He bought the rights. And he got in touch with me and said, hey, this is a big book, and I really don't have two or three years to go and teach a screenwriter all the nuances of the book. So I want you to write the screenplay. I said, hey, I'm game, you know, yeah, you know, let's, you know, let's get busy. So we, you know, he would be in the city someplace, Newark, New Jersey one time, LA one time, you know, Washington DC one time. This is funny, in Washington DC, we talked and he mentioned a restaurant, a very famous, very popular restaurant downtown. And I looked at him, you know, he said, hey man, let's go have lunch there. And I said, Denzel, man, that's a very famous place. It's lunchtime, crowded, man, we won't get in. And he shot me a look and he said, oh yes, we will. <laughs> and we got out of the limousine and the dude seen him and just said, hello, Mr. Washington, right this way. You know, I said, oh, D, go ahead, my man, you know, go ahead. You know, but so he and I worked on that script for like uh, two and a half years. This is Denzel Washington, Oscar winner, legendary. When he went to the studios and said, hey, this is how much money I need to make this movie, the studio said, no, not unless you act in it. He didn't want to act in it. He said, I want to direct it. And the studio said, no, you know. And he called me on the phone, he said, Will, I try, my man, I try, you know. You know, and so it fell apart. But then, two years ago, Lee Daniels, who directed The Butler, he bought the rights to the Sammy Davis Jr. book, which is right over there, and he, uh, uh, he wrote the screenplay, he's been in touch with me. He wrote the screenplay and he just took it to Hulu. So, knock wood, it shows up on Hulu 
uh, in the very near future. But 18 years later. Yes. For Sammy Davis Jr. Yeah, for yes. Sammy Davis Jr. I mean, like, no, no, no. Uh, you know, you know, writers writers can be paranoid. So I was at a, a school here in my hometown about I don't know shortly after the Sammy Davis Jr. book had come out. No, no, it was before. It was while I was working on the Sammy Davis Jr. book. And I was talking to some uh, fifth and sixth graders, fifth and sixth graders. And uh, whoever was the host asked me what I was working on next. And writers are very paranoid. So you don't want to tell somebody what you're working on and fear that they might run out and do it. And so, and I said, well, I really don't want to mention it, but I will tell you this. It's about a famous entertainer who was sort of controversial, uh, but had a big life, you know, and, you know, and I'll leave it at that. So when it ended, you know, the students are filing out, you know, and this little girl, you know, she, I don't know, she's probably nine or 10 years old, little blonde girl, long pigtails, she did like this to me, and she asked me to bend down, and I did, and she said, it's Sammy Davis Jr., isn't it? <laughs> and then I said, oh my God, oh my God, she's gonna take my idea and gonna run with it. <laughs> Something's gonna happen to me, I'm gonna break my ankle, and then I'm gonna be laid up for two years, and then she's gonna write the book. Oh, I shouldn't have said a damn word. <laughs> So, Will, when you write a book, you're gonna, you, you live with your characters. I mean, these are people you're living with for yep. a year or more, more, two, three years. Who were the characters in this book that you just enjoyed living with? I guess it would have to be uh, Harry Belafonte, uh, Harry Belafonte, James Baldwin, James Baldwin. You know, because James Baldwin was a film critic. And whenever these movies would come out in the 50s or the 60s, Baldwin would find some magazine to write a so-called review. But in the review, he would veer off and he would say, None of the black people who I know act like that. <laughs> I was, you know, it was really wonderful. Plus, I have a, you know, very, 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 very soft spot in my heart for James Baldwin, who tried to get in the Malcolm X movie made. He went to Hollywood, you know, he gave him his script. And I tell this story in the book. And Hollywood kept scratching out lines from his script. This is James Baldwin now, you know, who knew Malcolm X. He said, hey, I can bring a lot to the script. So Hollywood messed with his script so much that he walked away. And it laid fallow until Norman Jewison, Norman Jewison, Jewison got it, and then Spike Lee got it, of course. But the thing that, uh, that I knew I was going to have a picture in this book of James Baldwin, who wasn't a movie star, but, you know, he's in the book, really cool picture, is because when I was at the Boston Globe, uh, and I came in one morning, I was new to the staff, and the arts editor said, hey, there's a visiting writer at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. We need you to go up and write a feature story about him. And I said, oh, okay, great. You know, who's the writer? And the editor said, James Baldwin. And I said, 
<clears throat> excuse me? <laughs> you know, she said, James Baldwin. And so I hopped the train a few days later and went up there and sat with James Baldwin. And I said to myself, at the end of my chat with him, because I hadn't written one book then, not one, but I said to myself, at the end of my chat, and I'm going to ask Mr. Baldwin if he thinks I someday will be able to write books. And so at the end of the conversation, I said, uh, sir, uh, may I ask you something? You know, uh, he was smoking a cigarette. He was, you know, real, you know, he was, you know, inexpressive. He said, hey, baby, shoot. Yes, of course you can ask me a question. What is it? And I said, do you think, Mr. Baldwin, that someday I will be able to write books? And he was smoking a cigarette, and he said, how the hell should I know that? <laughs> uh, you, I have no idea what you'll be able to do in your life. You know? Why, yeah. I have no idea. And, you know, my head dropped. I felt like running out of the room. I was just thinking, oh, wow, he's going to call the editor and tell the editor that I asked the most insane question, you know. Yeah. How's that guy on the staff, you know? But Baldwin leaned into me and he said, hey, baby, but I tell you this, whatever you do in life, you must go the way your blood beats. Whatever you do in life, you must go the way your blood beats. Those words hang on my writing study, on the wall of my writing study to this day. I mean, so here I am nine, nine books later. I've gone the way my blood beats. All right. So we're going to be moving to our questions from live stream and in-person um, audience in just a few minutes. If you have a question, please make your way to the microphone now. Uh, before we take uh, audience questions, I'll have one final question to pick up on where your blood beats. I'm going to ask you to uh, tell an anecdote that I think will illustrate the how difficult it is to do a book like this, the depth of research um, that's a part of it. This is not you writing sort of essays about your personal feelings about books. These are deeply researched stories. And the process sometimes of how that information comes to you. So I heard you share this earlier this week about the Sammy Davis Jr. and the California Hospital. If you could relay that anecdote that just, that I, if I may boil it down to, I think, close to what you said, that if you go, luck will follow. Yep, yep, yep. Sammy Davis Jr. was in a car crash uh, in 1955. Little Will Hager was someplace in a baby crib howling in this city because I was one year old. So 1955, Sammy Davis Jr. was in a car crash in San Bernardino, California. And I had just started working on the book. So I flew out to LA to live out there for like seven months. You know, it was a whole lot of uh, folks who knew Sammy and still living out there. Actually, it was about a whole year that I lived in Los Angeles. Uh, but anyway, uh, I got in a car one day and drove to San Bernardino because I just wanted to see how the hospital looked, how the road looked that he was taken down and to go to the hospital. So I walk into the hospital. There's like three nurses at the nurse's station, and I tell them who I am. Will hey good. I'm a writer. I'm working on a book about and the entertainer, Sammy Davis Jr., who was in a crash three miles down the road and was brought here uh, that morning. And I just wanted to see the hospital and how it looks. And as I was leaving, uh, walking out the door, I just 
turned around and I just said, you know, it's such a shame that all of those people from 1955 are gone. I mean, and then one of the nurses looked up and said, ah, no, that's not true. Nurse Henderson is still around and she was, <laughs> she was on duty that night. And I said, excuse me? She said, Nurse Henderson, she lives down the road. Here, let me call her for you. So she calls Nurse Henderson. And Nurse Henderson says to this nurse to put me on the phone. I get on the phone and she says, in a way, I've been waiting for this call all my life. What you do is go out of the driveway and make a left and go three miles and you'll see Red Butt Road, turn right, I'm the first house on the left. So I run to my car, and get in the car and drive to her house. And I'm sitting there with the nurse and she's talking to me about Sammy Davis Jr., the look on his face, the scars on his face, all the questions he was asking. I was writing it down. She's telling me, she said, it was such intricate surgery, eye surgery. And we had one of the best eye surgeons. We were lucky in this state. In Dr. Fred Hall. And he was just wonderful. He explained it to Sammy. Then he did the surgery. It took about three hours. He was so great. And I said, uh, my goodness, wow, I'm so happy that I found you. This Dr. Fred Hall, are any of his kids, his children around? And she said, why would you want to talk to them? He lives four miles down the road. <laughs> and I said, wait a minute, Fred Hall, who did the surgery? is still with us and, and she said, oh honey, I'll get him on the phone for you. <laughs> and so she picked up the phone and dialed Fred Hall and he said, uh, Will, uh, you leave uh, Nurse Henderson's driveway and you make a right and then you go two and a half miles and then you make another left and then that's me and it's the only house, it's a very rural area and so there I am with Dr. Fred Hall. You know, he's, I don't know, he was in his mid 80s. He was a very young doctor then at the time, very famous. Anyway, and I'm talking to him and I said, doctor, even all this that you have told me, it's gonna be sort of hard for me because I'm not a medical writer to kind of explain all of this about the eye, all about the terminology, to explain all this in the book. I said, but I'm going to try to do my best to explain that surgical, you know, how it happened. And he said, uh, I think I can help you there because I kept a file, a notebook that says Sammy Davis Jr. Eye Surgery. <laughs> and he asked me if I would like to see it. Ah, uh, yes. He said, hold on a minute. And he went to his attic and he came back with a big yellow folder and said, Sammy Davis eye surgery. And all these terms that I don't even know how to pronounce and I could throw them into the book. And so that's why the scene of Sammy Davis's surgery uh, uh, sounds so authoritative because I got it right from the doctor's notes, <laughs> right from the doctor's notes. And so I teach at my alma mater, Miami University, and I all the time tell my students, if you go, something will happen. If you go, don't be a telephone reporter, you know, get out, get up off your seat and just go. Even if, even if it's just seeing how something looks or a road 
you know, just knock on the door, what I call old-fashioned shoe leather. Thank you, Will. All right, it's time for CMC's longstanding tradition to take audience questions. Jane Scott of CMC is curating questions from the live stream audience. For our in-house audience, please join Jane at the microphone. Please keep your questions brief and to the point. Jane, what is our first question? So we have a couple of questions, but any of you in the room that would like to ask questions, we'll go back and forth with some live stream and folks here. And I see we have the mayor waiting to ask a question too. I'm Carol Looper, and my question is, Confederate statues have been taken down in the South. Now we're hearing that in New York City, the city council has voted to take down the statue of Thomas Jefferson. How do you feel about that? You know, uh, you know the <clears throat> statues, of course, all over this country that honored slave owners, uh, that honored people uh, who led armies uh, to attack this country uh, should be taken down. Uh, I think, you know, and that's not saying that they shouldn't be studied, you know, or why they were put up. And at the outset, a lot of these statues started rising in the 1920s. 1930s, uh, you know, and but I think that the statues are used uh, uh, to reinforce uh, uh, racism. I mean, they just simply are. I mean, I like to see more statues of Rosa Parks, W.E.B. Du Bois. You know, we have very, very, very few of those type statues in this country. And I think, too, you know, we saw it in Washington, D.C., in insurrection. I mean, you know, we're still in shock in Washington, D.C., because every day there's something on the news about it. Video footage, this angle, this angle, you know, you know. And the sheer insanity of that, I mean, you know, I mean, we just lost a great patriot in this country yesterday, General Colin Powell. That's patriotism. Those people who charged the U.S. Capitol, it was a white-led mob who now start screaming to their lawyers, oh, I was a patriot, I was called there to save the country. No, you weren't, no, you weren't. You were trying to uh, deny eight million black voters from those swing states, you were trying to deny their right to have their votes, their votes counted, you know? Something else that's you know, very dangerous right along with those monuments is this race theory stuff that's going on. It's an excuse for people to you know, to, you know, to, uh, you know, to not teach slavery or not teach subjects that we need to be taught to learn. Look, you don't have uh, gangrene and you don't say, hey, you know what? I don't think I'm gonna talk about that gangrene in my leg. I think it might upset my wife. You know, I'm just gonna let it fester. No, you don't do that. You know, if we don't talk about things in this country, uh, you know, I do believe that Martin Luther King had a lot of currency when he said that this country has the ability to destroy itself. I was a foreign correspondent and I traveled all over the world. All my foreign friends think that this country has lost its mind. They do, I got friends in Indi India, Egypt, uh, South Africa, West Africa, they really think that this country is falling apart. I mean, we put a reality TV star, a nutcase, next to the nuclear bomb. I mean, a nutcase, a real misogynist, racist nutcase. I mean, you know, we put that man in the White House. You know, you all have relatives, I'm sure, who voted for him. You, you need to educate them. You really do. I mean, you know, I, you know, it's, it's mind blowing that that man was in the White House, you know, 
mind-blowing. But people in this state helped him. They helped him get there. This is a blood-red state now. All my friends ask me about it, you know, and it, it's heartbreaking. Fortunately, this city is blue, you know. Uh, fortunately, yep. Very proud of that, but, you know, I mean, you, uh, we put a lunatic in the White House. You know, we, historians are going to have to deal with that. Next, okay, Mayor Coleman. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> you said it all. <laughs> uh, I want to make a comment and then a question. My comment is to applaud you. Uh, for a lot of reasons. I've known you for a long time now. But what I applaud you for is you have never forgotten the city. You have never forgotten where you came from. You're now an international celebrity, national celebrity and influencer, uh, but you always keep your hometown your hometown. Yes, I you do. always come back. You always open your books here first, and you come back not just for that, but just to reconnect and be in the place that raised you. Yep. So uh, I applaud you for that. And I wish others would do that around the country. Thank you. Yeah. The question is, you have uh, spoken about how um, Politicians, in particular Barack Obama, uh, influenced film. Yes. And black film. Uh, can we reverse that a little bit? How has black film influenced the political agenda in the country? Uh, just to start you out, uh, uh, I did not realize until about 10 years ago. Uh, who Woodrow Wilson really was. Uh, but I just want to raise that and ask you to respond to the question of film impacting politicians or the political environment of our nation. Mayor, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, too, for always caring about my books and the subjects that and I write about. It really means a whole lot to me. It was easy to come home during your years in office. I must say that it was very easy. And we now have a mayor who has been uh, uh, very warm hearted and open minded uh, toward me and the type of work that I do. I'm very thankful that Mayor Ginther, that he cares about uh, the subjects that I write about. Uh, I think Mayor, Mayor Coleman, I think that any time there is a movie with a large black cast or a black leading man, you know, there's a great line in the book. Can I, I hope I can find this. It's like something in that James Baldwin said. You know, you know, it's never just a movie. It's always like in the person who is black in these movies happens to be teaching because whites judged blacks how we you know how we are or not are so many whites judge blacks by the blacks that they see in movies you know and so there's a great line here but from James Baldwin uh, that, it, uh, that says all of that, Mayor, if I can find it real quick. Okay, okay, well, I, 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 I just can't find it. But you know what he said, and I'll paraphrase it. He said, when the black actor, black actress is on screen, they often sneak a little authenticity into their performances. They like often veer off script and they do something so authentic, so real that it will 
you know, make somebody like a Larry James in the middle of the night say, that was a bit of subterfuge that that black actor was able to do that because they were dealing with a white screenwriter, white director, white producer, and they wanted to put some of them selves in the movie, excuse me, and they would do that. I mean, you know, something else finally. How do I get to write books about Sammy Davis Jr.? And because there wasn't a major biography about Sammy Davis Jr. when I started. Sugar Ray Robinson wasn't a major biography about Sugar Ray Robinson when I started. Third Good Marshals, Senate confirmation hearings, wasn't a book about Third Good Marshals hearings when I started. East High School, two state championships, a remarkable story, but nobody had ever written about it. This, 100 years, nobody had ever written this story. I'm fortunate that my editor, who is white, is one of the most woke people in this country. And the wonderful Peter Gathers, he flew here. He's been here in town for the past two days. Loved the city, by the way. Loved the restaurant. He and I went out to Lindy's, you know. He had some lamb chops. He loved it. Um, you know, and so, you know, I'm fortunate, you know, to be with a woke editor, you know, who understands the type of stories that I want to write because these stories haven't been written. You know, I kind of feel like I'm just trying to catch up. You know, the scales aren't balanced literature-wise. The scales aren't balanced, you know, and I'm just trying to tell stories that I think need to be told. Yeah. Wish we had more time, I really do. But we'll turn it back to Tony Bell for a concluding remarks. So I hope that you found today's forum inspiring, invigorating, emboldening, and enough to make you want to go somewhere and, of course, go where your blood boils, pumps, boils, beats. beats. <laughs> All of the above. Um, so please join us next Wednesday for when uh, next Wednesday at CMC presents Who Represents Who? redistricting and gerrymandering in Ohio with Kyle Kondik and a panel of experts. Thank you to our online virtual seat patrons and to the Columbus Dispatch for supporting today's forum. And thank you today to today's sponsors, Crab Brown and James LLP and Rayma Consulting Group. Thank you to the Emergency Response Fund of the Columbus Foundation for presenting our live stream in partnership with the Columbus Dispatch and PNC. And our special appreciation to today's speakers, Will Haygood, round of applause, <laughs> David Philippi, and our host, Ray Poprocki. And our special guest, Mayor Michael B. Coleman. Thank you for joining us. We certainly could not do this without each and every one of you. We look forward to seeing you next Wednesday at the Columbus Metropolitan Club and as we present another community conversation. Be safe, be well. Thank you.